Hey everyone, today we're looking at graphing our parent function for sine and cosine curves. So this is 4.5 day one. And we're going to look at the parent function here and then down below on this page you'll see more detail about graphing a wide variety of these sine and cosine curves given a variety of transformations. So let's go through the basic shapes. And here you can see I've already sketched out just a little tiny diagram of the unit circle, just identifying those quadrant angles and their coordinate points. So remember, a unit circle has a radius of 1. So this point on the far right side is 1, 0. So that's at 0 pi. At the top, we have pi over 2. On the left is 1 pi. And at the bottom is 3 has pi. And we complete the rotation back to where we started with, and that's 2 pi. So what happened to all of the other angles that we've learned about on our unit circle? Well, we're just jumping over them using just these critical values to plot those critical points, and then we'll just draw a smooth curve through those points. That way we can kind of get the essence of the curve without having to resort to all of that little detail. So what I have here is taking the function, and I've re reformatted it with slightly different notation because when you see the sine of x, you might think, oh, is that an x-coordinate that I'm plugging in? No, remember, that's just a symbol that represents the input, and the input is an angle of rotation. So if you think of it as sine of theta, that might make better sense. So the input is what we are using, which is the angle of rotation, and then the output, again, there's your function notation, but for the sine function, the output is always the y-coordinate of that unit circle. So my input is on my horizontal axis. There's the theta, which represents the angle of rotation at each of those quadrant angles. And on the vertical axis, we normally call that the y-axis, but what we're measuring here is the y-coordinate of that unit circle. And so at zero radians, we have a y-coordinate of 0. So let me plot that point here. Then we jump to the quadrant interval at the top, or the quadrant angle at the top. So pi over 2, that is a y-coordinate of 1. We jump to pi radians, that's a y-coordinate of 0 again. We jump to 3 halves pi, that's a y-coordinate of negative 1. And then back to the beginning, that's 2 pi. So these are the five critical values. You need to memorize their placement so that we can draw sine graphs. What we want to do though is we want to connect them with a smooth curve. We don't want a zigzag series of straight lines. So when you draw these at the maximum point, you want to make that look almost horizontal, just a very slight curve. And at your lowest point, get that just a very slight curve. And then we're going to kind of go up at a 45 degree angle almost, and then just kind of turn the corner very sharply. So we hit that maximum point, we come back down that minimum point, turn the corner sharply, and then kind of go back up at a 45 degree angle. So there's our curve. So we have a variety of vocabulary words to talk about when talking about parts of this sine curve. Here, right down the center, I'm using a dashed line to represent, this is the axis, sometimes referred to as the midline. And that's a very important feature because it is exactly halfway between the highest point and the lowest point. So if we were to measure the distance from that midline to your maximum point, that would give us the amplitude. And if we measured the distance from that axis to the very lowest point, that minimum point, that is also the amplitude. And what's interesting here is that the amplitude is always positive. So even if you have a negative coordinate point, when talking about the distance as amplitude, we, dis we say that's a distance of positive 1. So notice that the amplitude is the same as your radius on that circle. So if we happen to have a much larger circle with a radius of 10, well, then we would have an amplitude of 10. You can see that I kind of spaced out my labels on the axes. We could have put them a lot closer together. It would have made for a very compact curve. I just chose to space them out just to give it a little bit more room. Okay, we also have from the starting point to the ending point a complete length 
that we call one cycle, or we also call it one period. All right, and that is then divided into these four equal sized intervals. And this is really the scale of that horizontal axis. So there's four equal sized intervals. And these are really the quadrant angles here on that unit circle for our parent function. So in a more casual sense, I'm calling it the jump. You won't actually find that in the math book because it's not the real vocabulary word there. But I'm calling it the jump because what we're doing is we're jumping from 0 pi to pi over 2. We're skipping over all those little angles in between. So we're jumping from 0 pi to pi over 2 and skipping over those angles in between. Because we're not really plotting those points there. We're just plotting the maximum, the minimums, and these three x-intercepts. So what it's really doing, it's creating the interval or the scale so let me jot that little note down here. The jump can be thought of as the scale of that horizontal axis, okay? Those are the main uh, characteristics of our sine curve. When we're talking about the length of that period or that cycle, we're looking at how far is it from the starting point to the ending point. So if we start at zero and we're going to two pi, well then the period is a length of two pi radians. Now here I only drew one sine curve, but that's because we went around the circle just one time. If we were to go around the circle two times, well then we would go up to four pi radians, and that would be a whole nother series. So the concept here is that you can take that sine curve and copy and paste it repeatedly. You can just make it bigger. So there now you have two cycles. So this goes from zero to two pi, and then from two pi to four pi. We could even copy and paste it to the left, meaning now you're rotating around the unit circle in the negative direction. So here you have negative pi over two, negative pi, you keep going more negative. The point is that this goes on forever. So even though on our graph we've started at zero and stopped at two pi, technically those ends don't stop there. They go on forever in both directions. So the domain is a description of all those inputs, all those angles of rotation, that give us real outputs, and that means all real numbers. So here it is in interval notation. And the range then is your, again, this is on our vertical axis, which we often call the y-axis, but it's not necessarily y-coordinates. It's the output, which happens to be the y-coordinates of the unit circle, but the largest is one and the smallest is negative one. So our range goes from negative one to positive one. That also is affected by the radius of the circle. So if we had a radius of 10, this would be a range of negative 10 to positive 10. So whatever the radius is, that's your amplitude, and that also gives you the range as well. So a lot of those characteristics show up on the cosine curve. The only difference here is that my output is going to be the x-coordinate of the unit circle. So again, if we replace that x with the theta symbol to help better communicate that our input is an angle of rotation, here on the horizontal axis, I have my angles of rotation at each of those quadrant angles up to two pi radians. And then on my vertical axis, again, we usually call it the y-axis, but I'm calling it the vertical axis because what we're measuring is not the y-coordinates, but the x-coordinates of the unit circle. So at 0 pi radians, the x-coordinate is 1. So that's this point here. At pi over 2, the x-coordinate is 0. At pi radians, the x-coordinate is negative 1. And then at 3 pi radians, the x-coordinate is back to 0. And we finish up at 2 pi with an x-coordinate at positive 1. Notice it, perform, or it, it forms this uh, V-shaped graph, but don't draw a straight line. Again, we want to draw this curve through it. So at your maximum points, give it just a slight curve. It's almost a horizontal line. Your minimum point, again, a very, very shallow curve. And then we're going to turn that curve very steeply and go almost like a 45 degree angle through that second point and through that fourth point. So you can see how it kind of flares out on the ends and all very shallow curve there on the bottom. So again, you have the same axis right there in the middle. 
you have the same amplitude because the circle has the same radius. You have the same cycle length. So one complete cycle, same as one period. And that is divided into four equal partitions. All right, so again, I'm casually calling that the jump, but you can call it the interval, you can call it the scale. That is where we're going to find each of those five critical values when we jump from the first to the second, from the second to the third, and so on down the line. That's where each of those critical values shows up. So I'll label that as the jump. But again, that jump is really just forming the scale of that horizontal axis. Once again, you have a cycle length of 2 pi. Your domain is all real numbers because we could extend that graph endlessly and the more times we go around the circle. And again, your range is from negative 1 to positive 1. So those characteristics stay the same. So notice something else that these graphs have in common. Let's take that sine curve and put it on top of my second graph here. So you can see the cosine curve and the sine curve layered over each other. Let's take that sine curve and give it a horizontal shift. I'm going to shift it leftwards a little bit, and you'll notice that those critical points start lining up. The curve starts lining up, and that's really the only difference between the two. The sine curve and the cosine curve are, in fact, exactly the same. We call that a phase shift of 90 degrees, or in radians, pi over 2 radians. But what you need to do is memorize these five critical points. So for the cosine curve, you start on your maximum, drop down to the axis, drop down to the minimum, up to the axis, up to the maximum again. Whereas with your sine curve, you start on the axis, and then you increase up to the maximum, back down, back down again to your minimum, and then back up to the midline. So you have three x-intercepts here. On the cosine curve, you have two. I should say two intercepts on the axis. Okay, so we need to memorize where those points are found, the sequence of those points, and how they are spaced out. What we're looking at doing is taking the sine curve and transforming it in a variety of ways. So maybe we'll give it a vertical stretch or a vertical shrink. This could also include a reflection if we have a negative in front. We'll have to you know, flip it upside down. Jump over to the C and the D. Now, we used to call this H and K. So when we're graphing our exponential functions or the logarithmic functions or the quadratic functions, we always used H and K on those because that was the horizontal and the vertical shift. Well, here we're using C and D, but it functions the same way. We have a horizontal shift and a vertical shift. So that's your movement left to right and up and down. So B is kind of a strange feature here in that it actually impacts us in several ways. It is both going to affect our horizontal stretch, making it wider or compressing it down as a shrink, but that value of B is also going to show up in the horizontal shift, so it's going to help us determine where our graph starts, where the cycle graph, uh, where the cycle starts, and where the cycle stops. So we'll go through those in just a moment here. So what we're doing is we're finding the values of A, B, C, and D from the equation and turning them into these characteristics we just talked about. How do you determine the amplitude? Well, that's your value of A, but it has to be positive. That's why the absolute value's on it. How do you find the period? Well, okay, so they're using capital T to represent the period, but this is the calculation you have to do. The parent function normally has a period of 2 pi, but if we're manipulating it with a new value of b right here, then it's 2 pi over b. We'll reduce that fraction, and that will give us a brand new cycle length. That cycle length is always divided into four equal parts. So we're going to take that cycle length, that period, and divide it by four. That will give us the jump, which is also the scale of that horizontal axis. Now we can calculate where my cycle will start and where it will stop 
and we take everything inside those parentheses, so that includes both the B and the C. We're going to take everything and set that equal to zero for the starting point because on my parent function, it normally starts at zero. And my parent function normally stops at two pi. So when I want to find the stopping point, I'll take everything that's in those parentheses and set it equal to two pi. And in both cases, we're going to solve for x. And that will tell me where to start the cycle and where to stop the cycle. So B and C kind of work together to establish the starting and the stopping point. Lastly, the D, which is that vertical shift, that tells us where the axis is going to be located at. Because it's a horizontal line, you can represent it with this equation of y equals d. So when we go through graphing these, first we have to uh, gather up all of our data, our four points. We have to do the calculations to find each of these features. Then we have to take all of these numbers and bring them together in a useful way to graph. So as we get started, I'm going to suggest that you follow this sequence. When you get better at it, you probably won't have to follow that sequence quite so strictly. But you'll see me follow this along as we take a look at our, our, at our examples. Okay, so sine and cosine, the only difference there is where you have those five critical points. All right, let's turn over to the inside page here. We have three examples, and we're going to start off with a sine graph. So let's graph three times sine of x over 2. Now, to make this look a little more similar to the parent function and the template that we were just looking at there with the equations, if we have something being multiplied to x, we would really like it to be in front, where that letter b is. And in this particular example, it looks like x is being divided by 2. So let me just adjust that format slightly. So there's 3 times the sine of 1 half x. Now you have the A and the B. So the B right there is being multiplied to that X. So A is 3, B is 1 half, and we don't have a C, and we don't have a D. So D would be located outside of the grouping symbols, and your C is located inside. So that means there's no horizontal shift, no vertical shift either. Okay, step one. Let's find the amplitude. Amplitude starts with the letter A. We want the letter A, and it's always the absolute value of A, which, of course, is still positive. So that means 3 is the distance. To find the period, we're going to take 2 pi and divide it by the letter B. Now, our letter B happens to be a fraction. So remember that when you're dividing by a fraction, you instead want to multiply by the reciprocal. All right, so instead of dividing by the fraction, you're going to multiply by the reciprocal. And 2 pi times 2 gives me a result of 4 pi. So what we see here is we see a stretch. We're stretching it out. We're not going to 2 pi. We're going to 4 pi, so that's twice the distance. Now, what they call scale here, you can call that the jump, if you like. Uh, you're taking the period that you just calculated and you're dividing that into four equal parts. So what this is giving us is the scale for the horizontal axis. So I'm going to count this off by pi. So one pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, five pi, and so on. We can even go in the negative direction. So here's negative one pi, negative two pi, and so on. Now to find the starting and the stop, again, that information is all here on that first page. To find the starting point and the stopping point, we're going to take everything that's in the parentheses, both the B and C included, if we happen to have both of those, and we're going to set that equal to zero because that's where my sine function normally starts. We'll also set that equal to two pi because that's where my sine function normally stops, and that will tell us the starting and stopping points of this graph. So I'll just do that work right here in this little space. So. I have a B, I don't have a C, so it's just the one-half X. Or you can think of it this way as X over 2. So X over 2, we're setting that equal to 0 because that's where sine normally starts. And we're also taking that X over 2, and we're setting that equal to 2 pi because that's where the sine curve normally stops.
and then we're going to solve for x in both of these. So because x is being divided by 2, let's multiply both sides by 2 to isolate the variable, and we have x equals 0. So we're still going to start at 0. Multiply both sides by 2 to isolate the variable, and we get x equals 4 pi. So the stopping point is 4 pi. The axis, right, the axis, that's the horizontal line. And remember, the equation of the horizontal line is y equals some number. And for us, it's the letter D, which in this case is 0. So that means we have a horizontal line at 0. And that means it's still on the horizontal axis. The minimum and the maximum. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. What we've done here, we've done the amplitude, the period, the jump, the start and the stop, and the axis. Those are the five key pieces that you need, and those are outlined again here on the first page. Your amplitude, your period, your jump, your start, your stop, and your axis. So we've found those five pieces. We're ready to graph. A useful technique is to use a different color for that. Uh, midline. So step number one, graph the midline and just a dashed line will do. So it's at zero still. I guess I need to put a vertical scale on my vertical axis, don't I? So let's see, how about we just count by ones. So one, two, three. So step one is you find that axis. That's your center line. That's your midline. Half of the graph will be above it, half will be below it, so that sort of centers you. Then go to the amplitude. The amplitude is 3, so we want to count 3 above the midline, and my maximum point will be somewhere here on this amplitude of 3. You also want to count 3 below, so my minimum point will be somewhere here on this line as well. So I'm just using a light color here just to kind of give you the top and bottom points with the center line right there in the middle. We are starting at zero. So again, I'm using my lighter color just to kind of give my shape this boundary on the left-hand side at zero and a boundary at the right-hand side of four pi. What I'm doing is I'm sort of boxing in where my curve will be placed. All right, I call this the box. And the box is just setting up the boundaries so that we know the curve has to be inside these four walls. It will not be above or below. And what we have to do now is figure out how we, you know, where do we plot those critical values. So we go back to our function here. We have to graph a sine curve. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, what is the sine pattern? So the sine pattern, this is from our parent function. Here's my midline. We saw that the sine pattern starts on the midline, then increases up to a maximum point, then comes down to the midline, down again to the minimum point, and returns back up to the midline. So those are the five points. So what that means for us is we're going to start at zero. So at zero, I will find my first point on the midline. Then I jump to my maximum point. So that's what this scale is for. This is the jump. So we jump to pi, and now we're at the maximum. Now I'm going to jump to the next interval, which is at 2 pi, and that's on the midline again. We then jump to 3 pi, and that's my minimum point. And then we jump to 4 pi, and that's the midline again. So those are the five critical values for the sine pattern, and there's the curve. Now, here we're just drawing one cycle. We could, again, copy that cycle, and we could create two cycles. So oftentimes, books will say, graph two cycles or three cycles. So you could go outside of that box to the right or to the left because the pattern does extend. But I'm drawing this box just to give it the boundary so that we know where the first point is, where the last point is, where the top point is, and where the bottom point is, and the other points are on the midline. So that gives us a nice little framework to work from. Let's look at a few more examples.
Here's example two. All right, so this time we have three times the cosine of 2x minus pi, and then a minus two outside. So here's the a, here's the b, here's the c, here's the d, just jotting that information down. a is three, b is two, c is pi. Now, notice I'm just recording it as pi, I'm not recording it as a negative pi, so that would just help me later on because really I'm using B and C together in my calculations. D is a negative two, because that's telling me I'm going to go down two. So yes, it is a negative. Maybe I should put that in there after all, but we don't use C by itself. I'll show you in the calculations here in a moment. So we start with the amplitude. Amplitude is the A. That's always the absolute value. So that's still positive three. The period, that's always 2 pi divided by the letter b. Here our b is just 2, so 2 pi divided by 2 gives me exactly 1 pi. So that means we're taking the parent function, which normally goes to 2 pi, and we're squishing it down, we're compressing it down, so it only goes to 1 pi. So we'll have a complete cycle down to 1 pi. So then we take that result and divide it into four equal parts and reduce the fraction if we need to. So in this case, Pi over 4 is the scale, or the jump, the scale that I'm going to use on my horizontal axis. So here's pi over 4. So that's 1 fourth pi. Here's 2 fourths pi. Reduce the fraction, so that's pi over 2. So that's 1 fourth pi, 2 fourths pi. Here's 3 fourths pi. Here's 4 fourths pi, which is 1 pi. Here's fifth, 5 fourths pi. And here's 6 fourths pi, which reduces to 3 halves pi. And if we were to go in the negative direction, well, then this would be negative one-fourth pi, and so on. So that scale just helps me to set up a, a useful x-axis, or horizontal axis. Now, for the start and the stop, again, we're using everything that's in the parentheses. So we're using both the b and the c together. So c never really goes by itself. That's why I wasn't too careful about whether I had a positive or a negative, because really we use them in conjunction in conjunction. So bring those two together. We have the 2x minus pi. Set that equal to 0 because cosine normally starts at 0. Again, take that 2x minus pi and set that equal to 2 pi because that's where my cosine graph normally stops. We're going to solve for x. So the first thing to do is to add pi to both sides. So we have 2x equals pi and then divide away the two. So you get x equals pi over two. All right, so that's going to be my starting point. And if you like, you can put a little flag right there saying, hey, that's where I'm starting, or I'm using this box system, so I'm gonna use this little vertical bar to say, this is one of the boundaries of my box. Let's see where we stop. So again, add pi to both sides. So we have 2x on the left, we have 3 pi on the right. Divide both sides by 2 to isolate the variable, and we get x equals 3 halves pi. Now we want to flag that, so this is where we have to stop. So you can either draw a little arrow there to kind of signal, hey, this is the stopping point. Or if you're using the box method, here's my other color with the right-hand boundary. So I know that my graph will start here and end over here. That will be one cycle. The axis then is the letter D. So y equals the value of D, which is negative 2. So we're shifting down 2. So on my vertical scale, each grid line will be a value of 1. The midline, the axis, normally is found on the horizontal axis, but we're going down two, so shift that midline down two spaces, and again, draw a dashed line. There's your midline. Now we want to complete the box. So the distance from the midline to the maximum point is an amplitude of three. So from that midline, count three spaces above it, one, two, three. This is the top of your box. And then from that midline, count three spaces below it. And this is the bottom of your box. So right here, 
this is my box. This is where my curve will go, my cosine curve. And there's your midline right in the middle. So then we want to think about what that pattern is. Pattern is. So what is that cosine pattern? All right, so for that cosine pattern, what we found was it was the V-shaped pattern where the first and the last were your maximum, the middle was the minimum, and it looked like that. Okay, so we're ready to plot by taking that very first point, which is at a maximum, so it has to be at the top of the box, and we have to start here on the left-hand side, so this top left corner, that's my beginning point for my cosine curve. We then jump to 3 fourths pi, and now we're at the midline. We now jump to pi, we're at the minimum, so that's the bottom edge of the box. Jump to 5 fourths pi, we're back to the midline again. And then the last jump is 3 halves pi, that's where we're supposed to end up, so 3 halves pi, and we're back in that top right corner, and there's our cosine curve. Now again, that cosine curve is just one cycle. We could copy and paste that repeatedly to create a second cycle, a third cycle, and so on. And so there, we're just focusing on one cycle and how to determine the starting and stopping points of that cycle. So you can see that in both of these examples, I skipped over the minimum and maximum. That's really just a way of indicating where that amplitude is going to place your minimum and your maximum points. And I didn't jot it down here because I just visualized it here within the graph itself. So for the third example, I would suggest that you try this one first. All right, pause the video, take it as far as you can, and then when you're ready to check your work, turn it on and see how you do. Notice that there is no value of C right here. C is always inside the parentheses, and there are no parentheses, which means there's no need to include a C. You saw in the previous example how C was inside the parentheses and D was outside. Here, there were no parentheses, so the plus one is a D. That's a vertical shift. Amplitude is going to be positive two. The period is two pi divided by the value B. So again, you have this fraction here, remember when dividing by a fraction. Turn that into multiplying by the reciprocal. And the pi's will cancel out, meaning 2 times 4 is 8. Now that might seem strange, because up to this point, our period has always been in terms of pi. Remember, pi is about 3.14 radians, so we're just saying here that this is exactly 8 radians. Take that result and divide into 4 equal parts, and that is your scale, or your jump. So 2 is what we'll use on that horizontal axis. The start and the stop will take the pi over 4 times x. And we'll set that equal to 0 because that's where sine normally starts. And we'll take that pi over 4 times x, set that equal to 2 pi because that's where sine normally stops. And now to solve this, we're going to get rid of that denominator of 4 by multiplying both sides by 4. So we have pi times x equals 0. Divide both sides by pi, and you still end up with a result of zero. So in other words, we're still starting at zero. Uh, for the stopping value, again, multiply both sides by four. So those fours cancel out on the left-hand side. So now you have pi times x on the left. On the right, you have two pi times four. That's eight pi. And now to isolate the variable, divide both sides by pi and x equals 8. So you should have some confirmation in your starting and stopping values with the period, right? The period is the full length from start to finish, and sure enough, we're starting at 0, stopping at 8. That is exactly a period of 8 radians, and that's what we have there. So those should just confirm each other. That axis then is at positive 1. Okay, so with those values, we're ready to start laying down our scale on that vertical axis because we always start with drawing the axis, the midline, which is at positive 1. So here's the dashed line 
forward and midline. Then go to the amplitude. The amplitude is two above and two below the midline. So those are your boundaries, your topmost and bottommost boundaries. We're going to start at zero and end at eight. So those are your left and right boundaries. So this is the box. Okay, our curve has to fit inside that box. Which curve is it? Well, that's the sine curve. So that means our points start on the midline. Then we jump to two radians up to the maximum, jump to four radians back to the midline, jump to six radians, we're at the minimum, and jump to eight radians, we're back to the midline, or that axis, and there's our 